Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the Warren Lecture Day, Dr. Shu Song Jo from Arizona State University. Um, he's an associate professor of transportation systems in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment. Um, he focuses on dynamic traffic assignment, traffic estimation prediction, and large scale routing and rail scheduling. And he's also the invited chief scientist of the Beijing Municipal Commission of Transport. He's an associate editor of transportation research part C and network and spatial economics and he was also the formal chair of the informs reapplication section um, he has more than 50 papers related to dynamic traffic assignment and real operations operations research and without any further ado I'd like to turn the floor over to dr. Joe okay yeah thank you yeah thank you uh, Michael so it's a great pleasure uh, for me to present uh, these to the faculty member in the civil engineering you know uh, department here in University of Minnesota. So uh, uh, I know that the typical setup I have is a little bit different. Uh, I have previously I might have most you know, transportation system faculty members or students. So for this particular focus, uh, for this presentation, I would like to really show how from the civil engineering professor or, or faculty members or researchers, how you can see a new transportation systems and uh, how you can somehow learn and you know, after my one hour of the talk you know what are the new challenges what are the new approaches and what are the new you know, uh, opportunities so my goal is try to make sure you will learn something from my talk and uh, uh, I might leave a little bit you know, here and here uh, uh, to, to, to show my perspective so hopefully uh, uh, please bear with me uh, for this uh, presentation so again uh, uh, the topic will be these are very large scale transportation optimization and uh, um, uh, and coming from Arizona State University and uh, I would like to have the four uh, sessions I want to introduce myself a little bit and then I will really show some new perspectives when I try to serve as a invited uh, chief scientist in the Transportation Commission in Beijing, uh, particularly for very large scale problems and also new uh, challenges. And then I will go to the two modeling challenges. Uh, both really have the structures, right? So we have the structure engineering, we have these network modeling. I want to show how our transportation systems should, do, should be modeled in a structure. But maybe my structure will be a little bit different from uh, how structure you have in your payment or in your uh, building. All structure in transportation system also has some, some interesting constraints and objective functions. So I will show both perspective from a very high resolution in micro level uh, network and also from a high level resolution uh, uh, I, uh, which is uh, related to this valley. Uh, emerging machine learning, deep learning in a community. And by the end of this presentation, then I will try to show you we have many new opportunities. Okay. So introduction. So for most of the people, including Michael, you know, I was a programmer, <laughs> even a faculty member. I do a lot of open source development. So I'm uh, helping Federal Highway Administration to build a very large scale open source uh, uh, dynamic travel assignment. And uh, uh, in my almost like last <coughs> 10 years, we are, prop we are um, doing a lot of research and education, try to make sure students can understand a uh, large network. So typically, you know, the, 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 the largest network I face will be, this is our uh, Marin statewide model. Here is the Washington DC metro area. This is a Baltimore, and then we have many places with these traffic bottlenecks. As a transportation system factory, what we try to do is to model all the traffic congestion, traffic bottlenecks, and uh, try to either optimize the routes, the mode, and uh, the traffic supply to minimize the traffic congestion. Okay, and um, uh, in my own domain, I do do a lot of parallel computing, try to solve, try to predict the traffic evolution quickly. So when I uh, try to take many challenges, and uh, particularly when I just go between, uh, say, this uh, new invited position in Beijing, still affected at ASU, 
I see many challenges, and uh, uh, I will use the next few slides to show you. Uh, for example, in the United States, we have a very good freeway network. In, in China, they also have you know, many uh, uh, newly uh, established uh, freeway network. And if you look at these metropolitan areas, uh, in Los Angeles, we have a population of 12 million uh, people. Or if you look at the greater metropolitan area of Los Angeles, we have 18 million. Now, if you go to Beijing, you have 25 million. So now we really see more mega city, more region with these uh, traffic congestion challenges. If you go to, for example, New York versus Beijing, New York has the best subway network with many lines. And as you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five. And sometimes on the station, you have many tracks available you know, to really organize these uh, fully automated subway operation. And then uh, in Beijing, they just have many new lines of the subway system. There's a new infrastructure requires pre-planning, building, management, expansion. So the challenges over there is for who, uh, who is interested in this management planning, they need to really look at this large scale problem uh, uh, as a whole. Then, as we know that uh, recently we had this all new you know, venture capital like Uber, uh, DD is the uh, uh, Chinese version of the Uber. They have tons of capital venture to back them up. And if you look at the, the valuation of the uh, Uber, it's almost like $70 billion. You know, is, is a huge potential and is, is facing also a lot of challenges. As you can see, in the recent we have the first pedestrian accident in my ASU, Tempe campus. A um, uh, 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 homeless you know, person was killed by the first self driving car you know, uh, accident you know, uh, by Uber. Okay. There's so many discussion in the news. And now if you look at the users, so Uber now have 40 million users. DD also have about you know, over 100 million users. The core business they have is by promoting this new um, uh, smart mobility or this um, uh, informed decision, they can save the societal cost. They can also improve the convenience of the users. So there's a lot of ongoing discussion uh, in between industry, academia, and also uh, try to do something good for the community. So now, by, by, by looking at this, I see there are some challenges. There are some challenges for the faculty member like me. Uh, I refer this to the uh, structured modeling. Structured modeling. So traditionally, in our transportation domain, uh, we looking at the whole system as a traffic fluid. Okay, we look at this partial differential equation. We look at this as a traffic signal for inter, uh, individual intersections. We look at many things, either purely in mathematical model or purely in this computer implementation. And when we face with this very large scale system, we need to find a way to reach the balance between a very detailed representation of this state change by individual I will say drivers or uh, pedestrian or this uh, vehicle. And also we need to look at the impact from the grand scale in you know, how you can manage this say 20 million population, uh, 20 million traveler uh, traveling daily in a very large city. So the number one requirement is we do need to have some new mathematic models. Number two is we need to make sure those models are implementable in a very large computing in the environment like what we have in Uber. And also, we need to make sure all those foundations are solid enough for us to evaluate their impact uh, uh, from the individual levels also to the systems <coughs> level. So then, when I, in the last uh, five years, uh, when I moved to Arizona State University, uh, thanks to very generous support, uh, of our department, I've been doing a lot of this uh, soul seeking to see what are the new models I should have developed, how I can apply those models to address these new challenges. Then I'm looking back about a number of uh, models I built 
I really see something in common, which is the structure inside of those different models. So typically for the transportation faculty member, when we introduce our transportation system, we are see first of all is this, say this is a city with many tiny streets, and then we have the building. The building could be the location of house, location of office, and then we have the people moving from home to the office, then from the office back home during this 24 hour horizon. So that was a very micro level analysis. Then when you go up a little bit, when we try to do the traffic engineering or traffic network modeling, you will see this just as a network with a different color code representing traffic congestion, traffic speed, emission, pollution, many derived property out of this network. Then when you try to move up a little bit to this higher level structure, so for the city manager, they need to have many critical decisions to make. For example, uh, how many Uber cars I should allow in my city? Uh, how much emission credit I should assign to the different partners? How, when I try to build this new facility in downtown area, how much traffic I will introduce? And uh, 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 I, I I see many new you know, these are bike sharing services. Now how many these are new uh, dog list bike I should allow in my city? So many of these kind of grand question has to also answer in this grand scale. Then if you look at our transportation system as a whole, uh, me here as a transportation guy and I'm sitting here with a system. But actually before me and after me, before me is the traffic demand, you know, uh, all the activity generated from the human, from the society. Then after me, will be power supply, will be energy. And then the power supply itself is a network. They have these different power towers. And the energy is either, is either, uh, either this um, gasoline or electric you know, vehicle. They also have a network to support these necessary transportation function. So the question will be how I can really build a modulized network, a modulized structure, so I can talk to those different either colleagues or uh, those you know, different systems in a very natural language. Otherwise, what I see in many practitioners' uh, mentality is that they build just a simulation. They, they asked me uh, in my previous life, they asked me to do this traffic simulation for 10 million agents but only for one instance. And then if they ask me to do many instances, I say I don't have enough computational power. So we need to really aggregate those impact in our transportation system layer by layer, layer by layer, just like the internet. You know, you have this physical, you have this uh, communication, you have this application. We need to really build this kind of layer structure so that the system of transportation can be modeled correctly and then we can have a way to talk to power supply, talk to environmental, talk to these you know, many other in integrated component. So that's why it motivated me to really looking at the structure modeling in transportation system. So uh, typically what we do is uh, in a uh, micro level, you, know, you see all the vehicles driving here, this intersection. So we need to be able to model this new reality, connected vehicle, ride sharing service for the individual vehicles or, 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 or travelers, okay? Then go to the macro level, you need to look at this as a region. And then in between, there's a MISO level, which has a combination of these uh, grand scale uh, traffic dynamics and uh, some, some individual traffic statistics uh, to really model something, uh, uh, to model something uh, with enough balance to measure is a computational efficient and also mathematically you know, uh, uh, attractive. So, so that's why today I'm going to really focus on this layer to tell you how did you see this new transportation service as an individual trajectory. And then I will talk about something from the grand scale to see how we can aggregate those impact uh, as a system level. Okay. So now I go to my session three. 
how do they see these new transportation services? So the, the typical motivation will be this. Suppose in the future, in a city, uh, in Twin City or in New York or, or somewhere, and we have many blocks, and we have many self-driving cars. Those self-driving cars are somehow controlled or decentralized controlled uh, by this uh, uh, commander center or by a company of Uber. And then I have passenger one, two, three, and then they go to the different destinations like office, uh, a kindergarten, or shopping center. So if I can really know all the information of the travelers, I can pick up passenger one, passenger two, passenger three, and then I can just go to a very synchronized route for those services. So by doing so, I can reduce the total mileage traveled, I can reduce the emission, and then I can reduce the pressure on the transportation infrastructure. So we have many advantages of this ride sharing. But the challenges will be how we can model them quickly in a large scale and also capture all the interactions. So another thing I always want to tell uh, out of the transportation domain is just more than simple ride sharing. So if you look at Uber, if you look at public transportation system, if you look at the future transportation system, you need to know the distinguish between three terms. Ride hailing, just like Uber. Now you know you you you, you have your Uber I, 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 you have your Uber app, <clears throat> you have origin, destination, you do a single ride, right, with the Uber driver. Okay? Then uh, you can also have this uh, ride sharing, which means you do this uh, uh, Uber pool, then they will pick up passenger one, passenger two, travel, drop a one, drop a two. You know, to, to really share the ride, uh, but still, is those two persons are share the same trip without any transfer. Okay. Then the third generation is uh, maybe in a New York City, you have the terminal of the subway, terminal of the subway or maybe buses, and then you have the synchronized transfer between passengers or maybe someone can take the bike going from their house to the station and then take this mass transportation and then when they reach the destination and then they can uh, take another uh, vehicle uh, uh, go to the destination. So, so the reality here is uh, when you're going to an urban area, uh, if the parking fee or is a, the parking is extremely difficult to find, like many students at ASU, uh, they are more than happy to take the bike for one dollar, then take the bus, and then uh, take another bike uh, in the campus and then reach the destination instead of paying ten dollars per day for the parking cost. Yeah. So, so, so what I want to show you here is more synchronization we can have, and then we can better reduce the pressure on our infrastructure. So now the question will be: In the future, ten years from now or twenty years from now, how many vehicles are we going to allow? and how much emission we are going to have by having a different mode, and then how much energy or how much infrastructure we should plan to build. So all of those questions, somehow, when they go to our transportation system modern domain, it becomes this very central question of, with a long, short name, uh, VRP. VRP means vehicle routing with Pick up, delivery, and the time window constraints. So this will be PDPTW. P means problem, uh, pick up, delivery, problem with a time window. Because for transportation, you all have your own preferred morning time window, office time window, there are many, many different time windows. So, so, so when you look at this problem uh, as the foundation, then you can really integrate many other approaches, such as activity of the schedule, transportation service, and uh, some infrastructure on the urban environment. So, so, so I will say this VRP, PD, TW, this is a long name, really is one of the most difficult problems in our transportation system to model. 
So let me just try to introduce you step, step by step about this problem. Uh, almost like 20 years ago, you know, people are used to this uh, UPS or FedEx. So they already started solving this problem from the depot with the different passengers or customers, I will say, and then they send the package from the depot to different customers. So this is the first generation of the VRP or vehicle routing problem. So a, a UPS driver from the depot go to uh, this location one, two, three, four, going back, and then they only serve the passenger at a single location. So input will be the passenger location or customer location. The customer can be, uh, uh, can be a package. And then they, the passenger only have a very simple preferred time window. The output will be the physical routing in the transportation system. Now, if you look at the new transportation or this is the actual requirement, for all the customers we have, you have pickup location or the origin location, you have the drop-off location. So for us, you can do this O1 means origin one of the passenger, or I will say origin of the passenger one. D1 means the destination of the passenger one. O1, D2 means uh, this O and the D of the passenger two. If I do something like this, and then you can see this is an empty chip because I'm driving in empty. And then I do the service for the single passenger. And then I pick up the second passenger. So, so when you go to the second route, as I want to illustrate here, I pick up the passenger number three, I pick up passenger number four, but because both are origin. And then in this lag, this will be the ride sharing, you know, because I carry the two uh, passengers in my, uh, in my car. And then, then in this way, we are solving the problem of with the passenger's origin, destination, the time window in the origin, for example, in the house, 7 a.m., destination at the office, for example, uh, 9 a.m., and then what we need to do is we need to really schedule all those self-driving vehicles with the different routes, and also with a different, what is tiny, what is precise schedule, and I want to also determine how I can map the vehicle and the passenger together, then, and then determine the price. For example, yesterday when I go from the airport, to the Daisy Inn Hotel here. Unfortunately, too many travelers in the airport, they increased my price by uh, $37. Okay, this is called surge pricing of Uber. And then the driver took me on a shorter distance route, which means they, he said he's going to save me some cost uh, by driving this uh, riverside, uh, this street along the river. And then it cost me another extra 10 minutes of the driving time. And uh, when I look at my bill, still $37. Yeah, so there's so many calculations you know, in between, you know, in this new business. Uh, too much demand, too much vehicle, how the pricing should be calculated, and you know, how much you earn when you serve as an Uber driver, and what if the Uber driver will be eliminated by all the self-driving business. So for them, it's not about my routing itself, it's more about the life. It's about how much they can earn and then who is going to do this uh, business, right? this self-driving or this uh, ride-sharing business. So, so that is why what I'm talking about, even what is fundamentally here, but what I see in the future is all about this new market. We will see you know, very quickly how this demand supply will be you know, managed in a very smart way. So when I look at the literature in this VRP business, unfortunately, they do not see two things. They do not see the transportation network. You know, most of the, you know, the operations research uh, community, uh, including myself, typically we don't see the traffic congestion that much. And also we don't see the persons that much yeah, because we don't really see the time window of your uh, 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 departure. We don't see the constraints of your daily activity. We don't see your preference. You are willing to uh, share the ride with others or you want to stay with your family. So, so when we look at long list, we do have many optimization techniques such as I had just uh, 
I just listed here, column generation, binary decomposition, dynamic programming, they, they optimize many things, but typically they build a very complicated model. I will try to show you that. And also, while they try to solve this problem in the last 20 years, well, we still solve the problem in a very small scale. You know, I will say 20 vehicles, 50 vehicles, we can use some very nice decomposition scheme to solve this uh, a relatively large problem, but really address the problem of this Uber or self-driving car, there's still a long way to go to reach the full automality. So when I look at the current model, and uh, uh, I don't want to criticize any you know, existing model, well, well, but I want to really show you that what we do, I skip some details here, we have many equations. Each equation represents a preference constraint. Like here is my origin, here is my time window, here is my uh, capacity constraint. And then when they list many constraints like this, then the reality becomes typically for any problem we have, there are more than 50 or 20 constraints, literally, in the system. And then uh, what we do is we will have these constraints uh, built in in a commercial package, so for example, Cplex, for example, in other open source solver, and then we say, hey, let's try to ask this uh, computer solver to solve this for us. But the reality here is we need to see a more complicated transportation dynamics. And then I look at all those constraints. There are two constraints for me are very difficult to deal with. One is, is one is this capacity constraint. So how many vehicles are on the driver's seats or on the passenger seats? For example, in California, we have this high occupancy vehicle lane. They have these two, HOV2, HOV3, HOV3+. You know, they have only sensitive to how many drivers we can have. You know, in California, you know, many lanes are HOV3+, which means if you only do a simple ride sharing, you cannot use those lanes. This is a way for us to promote the, the use of this shared ride. But in our traditional model of the mathematic model, we are not sensitive to the load. Another one is the travel time. So, so typically, in our transportation network, the traffic congestion is very uh, dynamic. And uh, we need to really consider congestion at 8 o'clock, 8.20, 8.30. But for the mathematic model to derive this is a little bit difficult to, to recapture all the uh, actual dynamics in our system. So now I try to introduce our method. So first of all, let me start with a very simple six-node network with this is a one, two, three, four. Let's say those are the office. Uh, these are the house, and then from five to six, those are the freeway facility, and uh, those are the side street of the arterial with the traffic signal. So for us, we need to also build these additional links, so-called this service link. So this is a household, this is a house of passenger one, house of the passenger two, those are the destination, and uh, in here, there's a bracket here, means the time window I need to serve from four to seven, from eight to 10, in terms of the minutes or in terms of uh, hours. And then also I have the depot uh, uh, of the passenger, or of the vehicle. So this is something maybe a little bit different from uh, what we typically talk about in traffic. So what we do in our modern domain, we have three dimensions. So let me try to first introduce two dimensions, time and space. So in the high school physics, you know that you can always say, here is a time, okay? And then this is a one minute, two minute, one hour, two hour. This is a one dimensional space, okay? This is a space represent the different nodes I have in the previous network. So what we do is we compress these two dimensional network into the numbers. And those numbers can be aligned into here, just as I want to mention you. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, not necessarily in a one-dimensional space. Okay, we label them along these axes. And in this space-time network, we have a trajectory. 
So we, from the high school physics, we know that, oh, this is a trajectory, and then the slope will represent the speed. But since we do something here in the, uh, 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 this is a space compression already, so not necessarily all the vehicles are moving up. You know, they can also move in down, and moving up, but they're always moving forward, okay? And then the slope here represents the speed to some degree, and also represents some traffic congestion in terms of travel time. And then by using this time and space domain, I can literally try to capture this time window constraint. For example, I need to send my baby to the uh, kindergarten, I need to leave from my office or from my home between five minutes and seven minutes. So in this way, I can literally capture the exact time I need to have this service. And this is also the time window at the office. This is the time window at the depot. Then I draw many trajectory to pick up, deliver, pick up, and deliver. So by doing so, those complicated time constraints are embedded in my hyper network, in my space time network. This is good news. But what I try to, I'm very excited about this uh, new approach, actually the old approach uh, in our in a space time timetabling domain. But when I try this, I failed in my first attempt. Why? We have this very natural pick up deliver constraint, right? You need to pick up someone, then you deliver someone. Uh, when I try to do this uh, in my C++ coding or in my programming, I found that many vehicles, they will do the deliver, not necessarily doing the pickup. Why? Because they just try to say, I'm going to reach this place with this time window. I'm going to reach that place with this time window with some profit, you know, just like the Uber driver, right? I, I want to serve you so I can get the $30. But then not necessarily come into the airport to pick me up. Why? The reason is in this time and the space domain, I, has, I still have some missing constraints, okay, which is so-called the pick-up-deliver precedence constraint. So you have to do pick up someone and then deliver. Right? It's very easy for you to understand, but uh, mathematically, it's a little bit challenge. So now I recognize that I need to have, I need to have the depot. I pick up first passenger, second passenger, and then in my state, in my mind of the driver, I have the two passenger, P1, P2, together, and then I will drop off first one, drop off the second one, and then going back home. Okay? Or I pick up the first one uh, of the passenger number two, my state here is a P2, and then I will drop off this. So I need to add this additional constraint as another dimension. Otherwise, I cannot satisfy this very natural pick up deliver constraints. So, so, so by doing so, I can list all the combination. You know, I skip this one uh, very quickly. Then it becomes a computational graph for me because I can only go from the empty to pick up someone, P1, and then pick up another one, P1, P2. There's only some certain state transition graph I should model, okay? Maybe one student asked me, hey, Professor Joe, why are you not linking this P1 to P2 together? I will say, hey, this is illegal. This means you are that crazy driver. You still have the passenger one in the seat, and then you kick him out when you're driving, and then you try to drag another passenger you know, from the highway, okay, in the middle of the highway. So you cannot have that constraint. You cannot have that you know, transition. So after we build all of this kind of hyper network, then we literally we, we can really link everything like this. Empty car, passenger one, passenger P1, P2, P2. Then this whole network becomes a very natural, we call the high dimensional hyper network. Hyper network. Yeah, so uh, I have a very young faculty uh, uh, in Song here. You know, we developed this uh, time geography uh, concept together. So actually this is, when they have the two dimensional space, they map them to a one-dimensional space, as I mentioned, and the time dimension, or this is a time dimension, and then another state dimension here, 
with the empty car, P1, P2, P1 and P2 together. And then you have this very natural logic in the graph, in this high dimensional view, space time state view. And then we are able to really literally capture those reality. And uh, the, the, another joke I want to make here is the Uber driver never bring uh, his customer back home you know, to have a dinner. Why? Because he need to make sure when he goes back home, the driver's seat or, and the, the passenger seat should be empty, right? So, so by using this kind of hyper network, I will go very quickly for my presentation. Then we build the network very easily. And then the only constraint we have is the passenger need to be served exactly once, OK? And then I, all the other capacity constraint, time window constraint, origin destination constraint has been built. It. And then uh, if you're familiar with the optimization, we do the log long generalization, we dualize this constraint, and then we can literally calculate the price for this passenger, just as I mentioned to you. How much price you should charge me if I have two professors both going to the same university, uh, holiday in, if we do the right sharing, you know, how much you should charge me for this service. So then I skip the mathematic details. Now we are able to build this new generation of hyper network based transportation system representation. And uh, we build a C++ dynamic programming code as an open source code. We are able to solve very big instances. One is in Phoenix. And um, uh, 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 my first attempt, I saw that 50 passengers, I was very happy already because typically they don't have a complicated transportation network. For the first time, we are able to see this traffic network in the real life. Then I do this at very large scale, first mile, last mile challenge with almost uh, uh, 800 vehicles, okay? And uh, uh, with 9,000 customers or packages. And then we, we use this methodology for this uh, challenge. And then we are able to really solve that quickly by using this uh, what a nice implementation because all the constraints are built in, okay? And uh, this is uh, in the city of the Shanghai. This is original origin destination request, and then this is optimized uh, uh, transportation network. Then this goes to another what essential question I have. I say, wow, this is hyper network is really similar to the concept I know from this story of blind man and the elephant. I don't want to say that I'm, uh, I'm not blind. Actually, I'm still blind, okay, in this concept here. And, uh, the transportation system itself is a high dimensional elephant, three dimensional or four dimensional. Originally, when we do the model, you know, we may be only touch, hey, this is a snake. Hey, this is a tree. Hey, this is a rope. I mean, I will say I'm still here, okay? And I only see three dimension, okay? And uh, fortunately, I see in uh, one visit, MIT visit their department of mathematics, they have a similar picture for many mathematicians. They also need to see this high dimensional view. Uh, there's a curse of dimensionality, but they also need to really understand as a faculty member or as a researcher, how we capture the essential constraints in this network. So I have 10 minutes to go. I will go very quickly. Now, I model this individual level, right? Now, my second challenge as a system level, I will say, hey, I need to do something to really capture all the different scales, origin, destination, different routes, different location. How do I do that? So fortunately, as I know that uh, in the last 10 years or the, in the last 20 years, we had two blessings in our community. Number one is the big data the big data with the residential survey, cell phone location data, and the GPS location data from your smartphone, sensor count, and many behavior data. And as we know that Facebook also had this wonderful data set. And we need to combine them together. Then, then the question here is how, do we, how we can use it. So I also I do some you know, related uh, review. I look at the current Another blessing will be the deep learning or machine learning community. They do many layers, 
So in 1943, they do only just one neuron with a simple equation here. And then in 1985, they do multiple layers. And then my motivation along this line say, what kind of layers I should have in my transportation, right? Previously, I have the trajectory. Then I need to learn how to use those layers, you know, not necessarily as a black box, as we can show here. You know, machine learning now is extremely popular, but they don't have enough intelligence in between. So when I look at this, I say, I'm going to say, uh, I don't want to have this as a black box. I don't want to train these multi-layers of neural network. Let me do something in between. So this motivated me to really see my previous system as a whole. Okay, then how do I look at? I do some literature review, and one of the secret weapon in the machine learning or the deep learning community is back propagation. Back propagation is a way to calculate those marginal, those gradient back and forth, for, uh, backward and forward. So let me just use this very simple network to show you. Uh, you have layer number one, layer number two, Layer number three, layer number four, you're moving forward, okay? Then they can try to see is there any objective function or loss function or estimation, error, you see the error, and then they propagate the error back to the up layer, then back to another layer, then back to another layer to really do this so-called machine learning. The beauty of the current machine learning community is that they can build many layers very easily. Now with these supercomputer clusters or computer. The challenge for us as a transportation system faculty member here is how I can link those layers to my previous dialogue, right? Uh, with origin, with destination, with the different routes, with the different lag or the different link. Then good news is since I'm a trained in uh, my mentality as a network modern person, I see something like this. Here is your house. This is origin. And then you may go to two locations of your office, okay? Office number one, office number two, or maybe shopping mall number one, shopping mall number two. So this is origin, this is a destination. And then for each, this is a origin destination pair then you might have different paths to select. Yeah, just as I mentioned to you, there are many paths along the network. And then the different paths, they might overlap with each other on a link, this is a spatial link. So, so by doing so, we are able to model, just as I mentioned previously, this origin, destination, path, link, not necessarily just as a simple spatial representation, but with these layered, representation. Then we can always try to move forward to show what kind of traffic congestion we have. And then we can move backward to see, do I send too many drivers on this route? Do I have uh, too many emissions on this region? And then I will use this machine learning to do the back propagation to propagate those error back. Then when I try to learn this uh, new technology, that I recognize is not about neural network. It's about something they call computational graph, CG. Computational graph is really what they use in Berkeley. You know, they invent the neural network and then they recognize everything they have is a graph, just like a simple, you know, what I want to show you here, uh, A plus B, B plus one. Any function can be decomposed in a computational graph and then they go back and forth, back and forth, do this calculation. So when I recognize this insight, we are able to, just as I mentioned to you, to really map our transportation decision from the origin layer, generating how many ships, to the destination, what kind of activity you have, how many paths you're taking, and how many departure, what the departure time you have. So layer, layer, layer by layer, I map those decisions in a computational graph. And then I lay this out, not just moving forward as a mathematic program, and also I'm moving backward by really having the, all the uh, uh, data set available, such as the survey data, household survey data, 
uh, smartphone data on the OD layer, on the spatial distribution layer, sensor data on the link layer. So each layer can represent some data set or some, some, some performance function. Then we move back and forth. You know, so I say one origin, destination, I skip this, some details, departure time. And then now we build a transportation layered structure in their popular machine learning or deep learning uh, uh, network. And then my student was able to show me that, hey, this is artificial neural network, but in the tra transportation terminology. And uh, with that, we can build many objective function. And then with that, we can further try to say each layer is a neuron. And uh, with this is a decision, thanks to some simplified representation I have. And then with that, I skipped all the mathematic notation. We build the simple network to test. And then even we have some uh, non-convexity, uh, non you know, some non-convex function is a little bit difficult to converge with the first 100, 200 iteration. But when you really have the power of this machine learning, they train many, many, many iterations, going backward and forward, by using this brute force computational way, we are able to reduce the error or reach the better optimality you know, to some degree. Okay, I will say this is still uh, ongoing research, but I want to show that now I can see that we need to really build a lower level representation, a higher level representation to capture the system. And then we fortunately we use this TensorFlow, which is open source version of the Google machine learning. And we are able to really simulate and also predict the number of OD pairs in our Phoenix community in the sub area. For example, they have uh, three months of the data for me. I do all the training in the machine learning environment. I made my prediction for the one month. Look at the result. So we are able to capture those origin, destination, departure time trip in a fantastic way, but with enough data of the three months of the records. So this gave me some new hope. I say now I, then I can see this hyper network is complicated on the foundation, then I start layer by layer building some, some hyper network abstraction, a structured way to represent their marginal. So uh, then I will say, you know, to sum up here, I'm still someone in the middle and doing the transportation. I have been really had the blessing to use the techniques of operations research, transportation engineering, computer science and the time geography in many dis disciplines. And then we try to find new applications along this way. And then when I go to my traditional multi-layer network, this is a spatial layer in most of the people's mind. Now I see in the model, we have this high dimensional trajectory. We have this layer network. And then uh, currently I'm working on try to do a better representation on the layer in the middle, try to merge them. And uh, then going back to the last slide here, and uh, uh, previously they want to show this uh, structured modeling uh, uh, from the elementary structure like trajectory, a modular structure like layer by layer in the middle, some kind of aggregation between two uh, uh, traffic state dynamics and uh, the, the individual decision. We are almost in a very exciting time to look at what are the structures we should have in this human-oriented uh, complex system? And I skip my uh, summary here. And uh, my last slide, I just want to show that. I see here is a tree. And uh, uh, traditionally, we are here for transportation system. We see many vehicles driving, many data uh, uh, being generated to our foundation. And then, uh, I have been learning some finite machine, finite state machine uh, from the computer science, from the operations research. And then there's a new area of this deep learning. You know, they have multi layers of structure. And I'm somewhere here to use this hyper network to represent the complex structure. And uh, I want to say, uh, as a concluding remark, I see there's a new opportunity.
And then we need to understand how to use these structured modeling techniques to capture the essential constraint and then to better model and then do something good for our society. And hopefully, maybe 20 years from now, when I go to uh, University of Minnesota and uh, I'm going to have a self-driving robot to carry two passengers with me together and then save my tra transportation cost maybe to $10 per trip. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zhou. Um, we have some time for questions. <laughs> You gotta give me that microphone. <laughs> uh, on kind of a crude level here, which uh -huh. is how I'm grasping this at this point, okay, what it kind of seems when you're talking about your Uber drivers is, you know, he starts out at home and he does a tour and has to end up back at home. It seems like what you've managed to do is take a tour problem yeah. and replace it with a shortest path problem. Yeah. yeah. Which, if you could actually do that, would be converting an NP hard problem to a. Uh, type P problem. Mm -hmm. All right, so where have I missed the point? All right, because uh, I don't point, really think that that's happened. Yeah, the point here is the shortest path is really from origin to destination of the driver's perspective. When they try to serve many passengers, they also need to really add the intermediate nodes, say passenger number one's house, passenger number two's building. So they need to do some additional tasks in the middle, and uh, those tasks has some time window constraint. Those tasks have some precedence constraint like project scheduling. And uh, they need to really capture some additional dimension of different time, different these are traffic condition, different state change. So essentially, this is the shortest path problem. But what I have is a time dependent with a time dimension, state dependent with the state change, and uh, with some pricing scheme. So it's a, a, a enhanced version of the shortest path. And then my, in my second talk, it's more about when you have so many different shortest paths together, how do you really capture the joint impact of the traffic congestion or this in other you know, decision-making behavior? Yeah. OK, so where does the uh, Uber driver end up at the end of this? And what does he do after that? Yeah, so the Uber driver now, mostly they do, if you look at the state, they do this uh, ride hailing, which means they just carry one single passenger, right? And uh, they, they have many empty trips, and uh, they are still the waste in the cost of waiting. And uh, uh, we need to automate many processes so that we can do more ride sharing. And uh, uh, for the transportation community, we need to really promote this uh, synchronized transfer to really have a better connection between public transportation system and uh, the, the, the data sharing, and uh, to make sure for many low-income families in the future, they don't necessarily to own a car, but uh, to, to uh, uh, enjoy this accessibility uh, uh, from the new system. So, yeah. so that was a point that I want to make. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It was a great presentation. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, so the capacity constraints, like how, how many passengers can be picked up by the taxi, uh, that makes the problem very complicated. So can you flash some light on how, it, how challenging it is when the capacity can be increased? Like you can pick up four to five passenger on, on a single ride. And my second question is, uh, you mentioned something about price. But like, what methodology you use to uh, how how to how to decide what prices should be charged to different passenger? Like, what method did you use? Yeah. Okay. okay. The first question is, uh, since I had this additional dimension about the state, so somehow I was quite easily to impose the capacity. Like, how many seats you have? You know, two seats or three seats. So when I do this state change, I'm not pushing more passenger into the seat if the driver seat is already full. You know. So it's more like a computational code, coding's trick you know, to represent this state. Uh, uh, mathematically, it seems quite easy, but historically, we have not done that you know, efficiently. And uh, uh, number two, for the pricing, now I'm still on the surface of the routing, the shortest path. When you have many, many routes available, then will be a matter using this pricing 
method to see what's the best, uh, first best pricing right, for the society. Maybe some kind of second best pricing or maybe some pricing considering the driver's preference, right? And then the pricing consider the, uh, the passenger's preference. Yeah, so, so there's another layer I have not touched upon yet. Yeah, so, so this will be quite interesting if we build a solid foundation about how many paths you have yeah, or how many options you have. And then if, I will say you can, someone can use a game, uh, a game theory to really list all the different options. And then from there, try to select the reasonable or maybe the second best pricing to make sure you attract enough driver to serve and also you predict the incoming demand uh, uh, from the airport, make sure you can send enough uh, drivers to do the service. Yeah. Or maybe uh, op operate in the bus or a self-driving bus to really reach the balance between the service quality, uh, profit for both uh, service provider and the constraint for the passenger and also in a fair needs constraint. So there's many things we can build on some good foundation here. There's no yeah. clear model yet. Not yet, yeah, not yet. Yeah. And also, like, I understand that the problem can be solved easily with the, so when you have only capacity as equals to two, the problem can be easily solved with the combinatorial optimization. Approach. Yeah, yeah. But when the capacity increases, this complicates the problem. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's that's what you proposed a new method, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we want to look at the marginal. Yeah. You know, instead of I, I always to say, uh, put forward, then look at the marginal, then change something. Yeah. Otherwise, if you say if you have a taxi with a two passenger, it's okay. When you have a bus with a thirty passengers, then it's an issue. Yeah. Now this is not a serious question. So what do you do with a guy with a red Mini Cooper in all this system? And he wants to drive any place? Yes. Is, he, uh, is he going to be uh, becoming uh, extinct? I, I will say, you know, this, is a, this is a question I'm happy to answer. The reason is I, I think in the future, there's an allocation of the resources or infrastructure resources to our community. You know, there are, there are someone reserved for, someone just like to drive, someone want to really serve for the, uh, reduce, uh, to, 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 to serve this uh, transportation or to serve the community. But eventually, very similar to the internet, you know, uh, 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 someone they do, they serve the internet for their own business, someone they serve internet just for their pressure. There's always some kind of pricing scheme in, in, in the future to see how much I need to charge you if you drive. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will say I don't want to say pricing is the future, but in the future, you know, someone need to pay either by mileage or by, you know, by some some mechanism about the infrastructure resource they consume. But it's okay. You know, I'm not just putting all the human driver in you know, out, out out of this picture. No, I won't be around anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Dr. Joe, again for coming.